I am a fan of roller coasters. I love uh, the higher, the faster, uh, the feel of zero gravity, uh, the better. And for that reason, a couple months ago, I took my kids to Six Flags in, um, in New England here. And there was a, a coaster called the Superman that the only ride we rode twice that day was the biggest ride. So you look at the ride and you're like, okay, well, whatever's the tallest and the fastest, that's what I want to do. Okay, some of you are like, never, all right? When we were getting uh, closer to the line, and the older I get, the more careful I, I try to be. Uh, but when you're in a line for a roller coaster, and it, the point of an amusement park is to amuse yourself, which is to not think. But the older you get, the harder it is to go through life without thinking because you're thinking, what if, and then you fill in the blank, like what if the guy running the coaster is having a bad day? What if the mechanics from the previous day overlook something and it's not quite safe? What if the seat that I am sitting in, the strap doesn't work as it should? What if the chain taking you up this 200 plus foot hill has some issues? I mean, all these things go through your mind, right? When you're older, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, this is so much fun, it's great, I'm here with my friends. When you're a dad and you're there with your kids, you're like, you're thinking about these things and what you have to do is put all of those what ifs in the back of your mind, like this is gonna be a great ride. All right, and we're talking and we try not to think about the what ifs. Because when you really think about it, I have no idea what these kids running the, the coaster, if they're having a bad day or not. I don't know them from anybody. I don't know one person that worked on this roller coaster. I don't know anybody that works at Six Flags. All of this ride, which we did twice, was an exercise in faith. You don't know the person who assembled your car. But you got in your car this morning, and you drove here. You likely don't know the person, like I got some new tire, had to get some new tires on my car. I don't know the person who worked on my car. I don't even know what they look like. I dropped my car off, I picked it up, and it was done, and I paid in the money. I had to exercise faith. And when it comes to salvation of our souls... exercise faith, you're exercising faith right now in fear. You're exercising faith right now in your air conditioner. That there's not some sort of poisonous gases coming out and uh, causing all of us to be brainwashed and do everything that the pastor says. This doesn't happen here, okay? You're exercising faith that the coffee that was made that you're going to drink uh, or the water fountain is, not, is, is functional. We exercise faith all the time. Why is it hard for us to see that salvation is by faith alone. Well, we struggle with Romans 1 and 2 and 3 now, and we're getting to the end of 3, and what Paul's going to say uh, at the end of 3 is, it is faith alone. Since salvation is by faith alone, Then, we've got five verses here to look at, verses 27 to 31. The focus of 22 to 26 was on the righteousness of God, which is ours, if you look at the end of verse 26, it is who has faith in Jesus. Old Testament, New Testament, this theme comes out. The just shall live by faith. We do not live by intellect. That would be terrifying. We don't live by our good works. That also would be terrifying. We have eternal life promised and given to us by a loving, powerful, wise God. And he says it is faith alone. 
why is it faith alone? And the, that's the question we'll ask the text, and he starts with a question in verse 27. Then, what, since it's faith in Jesus, right, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. So, faith alone. Our salvation is by faith alone. It is eternal life. It is if we have faith in Jesus Christ. We sang a song in Christ alone. I don't know if John looked at my notes that I had. I don't think he did because I uploaded them last night, late. <laughs> and they were, he said he mentioned faith alone in our, in our introduction to um, one of our songs. In Christ alone. God has orchestrated the singing and the word here to match this morning. What does Paul want the Romans to understand about faith in Jesus and salvation? He asks a question, what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. Simply faith alone eliminates Verse 27, it eliminates boasting. On our church sign out here, it says, By grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's, it's one of the most, this verse, 327 and Ephesians 2.8, are so helpful for the moral and for the religious people that we talk to and share Christ with. And they think, but I have to do something. It is too simple to be faith alone. And we tell them, it is faith alone, and this is why it's faith alone. You know why it's faith alone? So that you and I cannot get to heaven and say to each other, what did you do to get here? What did I do to get here? And when I tell people I'm a pastor, and I've been on a number of mission trips, and I try to think of every good work that, and I visit people, and, and I have given my life to the ministry, that's not the reason I'm going to heaven. It has nothing to do with why I'm going to heaven. Because I'm not going to get to heaven because I'm a pastor. Because I give my life to ministry. Because I study the Word every day. It has nothing to do with my salvation. God has no favorites. There's no distinction. We saw that back in 22. And so no one gets saved and then boasts about their salvation. I could boast about going on a, a, the fastest roller coaster in New England, but I really didn't do anything other than pay the money and I let them strap me in and I held on and acted tough and brave. That's all I did. And at night, whenever we were riding at last, there were bugs hitting you in the face because we were right on the front car. You had to keep your eyes closed. All right, so I did that. But other than that, it was just so, sit down and hold on and uh, try to keep my hands up so my kids would think I was brave uh, the whole time. And trusting in the lap bar. Trusting in the mechanics, trusting in the person running it, trusting in the brake system, trusting in everything. And when you can trust and you watch a number of other people do it, you're like, this is a trustworthy ride, and you, have, and you can have a good time. And you can watch throughout the pages of, and Hebrews 11 does this for us. It brings out the people of the Old Testament who had faith, and their faith in Christ alone, and in a coming Messiah of the Old Testament. He was going to come, and He was going to come, and you trust in God, and the just shall live by faith. And Abraham's faith is magnified in Hebrews 11, and Moses' faith is magnified, and even someone like Rahab, her faith, and Samson, their faith is magnified in Hebrews 11. And it wasn't their good works. Samson had very few good works that we can see in Scripture but he trusted God. Rahab had a very sketchy background. 
She was the Romans' one person, yet she'll be in heaven. And the Old Testament and the New Testament point to her as a woman of faith. It's faith alone. Why is it faith alone? Because God does not want us to boast. Verses 22 to 26 was so focused on God and His righteousness giving us. We are only, He is the just one. He is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus so that we have nothing to boast about. And Paul says it in emphatic words. What, is, what becomes of our boasting? He says, it is excluded. It eliminates boasting. By what kind of law? So what did you do to get your salvation? Not by law, not a law of works, but by the law of faith. We're trusting in what Christ has accomplished. And we can see throughout the pages of our Bible, throughout the pages of church history, and watching Older saints pass from this life and look at their faith and say, they have peace. They have something that I don't have. And that's because God gives them a peace that surpasses all understanding, as was also mentioned previously in our service. So simply faith alone completely eliminates boasting. No one will be boasting in heaven. No one will be in heaven because of all that they have done to get there. Everyone will be in heaven because of Jesus and only Jesus. It eliminates boasting, verse 27. Verse 28, for we hold or we maintain that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This word hold or maintain, another translation says, is this word, it's also translated conclude. It's a calculation. Now, there are calculations, and people that know physics would look at roller coasters and say, this is how it works, and most of us don't care about physics. They just want to make sure we're safe on the ride. Uh, but when it comes to our faith, we conclude, we calculate, and come to this conclusion that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Everyone who has been justified previous to Paul writing Romans has been justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He's going to talk about Abraham in chapter 4. But here's the conclusion that Paul has come to. Here's the conclusion that he has tried to bring everyone in all of his missionary journeys to the, the religious, to the moral, to the immoral. He's tried to get all of them, their mouths shut, all of them guilty before God and say, you need the righteousness of Christ. And when you realize you need the righteousness of Christ, the person says, so how do I get the righteousness of Christ? And the answer is faith alone. You trust in God to give you. Now, it's also repentance. We saw that back in, in Romans 2, 4. But here, we are justified by faith. And he's comparing faith with works as he has also done previously in this chapter. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So, what does it eliminate? It eliminates salvation from works. It's completely eliminated. We've seen it now. He's said it in no uncertain terms. And now he comes to the conclusion and he wants everyone following this logic. And remember, this is a Romans is your logical friend. Here's the logical conclusion of all of Romans 1, 2, and 3. Here's the end of chapter 3. And here's the logical conclusion. Salvation from works is impossible. Salvation by faith is the only possibility. That's the conclusion. Okay? And... Romans 1 through 3 leads us to this conclusion. Simply faith alone eliminates boasting and it eliminates salvation from works. But it also, here, the last three verses of Romans 3, is going to, salvation by faith alone is going to clarify three things that some people, Jewish people, religious people, and even immoral people, are confused about, are uncertain about. How do you trust in a God that you don't know? I have talked to people and told them to trust Jesus, and they say, who is Jesus? Okay, so without even knowing who Jesus is, 
will you say, okay, well, there are four large books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those books are written for the person to help them to realize Jesus is God. Jesus is trustworthy. Everyone who came to Jesus was never cast out. Jesus is a tr- the trustworthy Savior. So the question that you can ask yourself as you're reading through the Gospels and you're talking to a friend who might be a skeptic and he doesn't know who Jesus is, he's not sure why we have to trust in this Jesus who he's not sure uh, who he is, say, is he real? Is he trustworthy? And reading any of the Gospels, you should come to that conclusion. Yes, he's real. This is a real guy. He was really God as well, because only God can do the things that are recorded in the Gospels. And he really did die on a cross, and he really did rise again from the tomb. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, and he appeared to 500 different people, and multiple different people at different times. He really is at the Father's right hand, because Acts 2 says he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit really did come because there's evidence of that in Acts 2. And the Holy Spirit really does live inside of us. There's all these things, this, this, this chain that, that, we, that people that have never read the Bible, never been to church except for a wedding or a funeral or a, a, a relative's uh, christening, they don't know Jesus. So you, it may take months for you to walk through one of the Gospels with them, slowly, carefully answer their questions, and say, does this make sense? Do you see what God is showing us about His Son in these Gospels? And here, Paul's going to briefly, in three verses, clarify things about who God is and what salvation uh, is and does and who it's for how people are saved. All of this is here in uh, these three verses. Verse 29, is God, again questioning, but giving us uh, rhetorical questions, or is God the God of Jews only? If you were to ask Jewish people, now Paul was adamant for Judaism, trying to stamp out Christianity when he first heard about it, um, giving his approval to Stephen's death by stoning. If you were to ask Paul, Paul, from all that you know of the Old Testament, is God the creator and the judge? Is he the God of the Jews only? I have some verses up here from Isaiah. There are other verses from Isaiah. I just chose two, uh, 56.6, and the next slide will have 56.7 on it. But at 56.6, Isaiah 56 says, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord foreigners are non-Jewish people. This is in Isaiah. This is the Old Testament of which Paul and all Pharisees and religious people knew would say, well, if Isaiah 56 says the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, this is someone who follows the Lord in the Old Testament. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and who does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant and we'll get verse 56, uh, verse 7 on the next slide. This is talking positively about people who aren't Jewish. And there are multiple people that are mentioned that are not Jewish in the Old Testament. Several of David's mighty men and the men that followed David around were not Jewish. Some of them were Philistine. They were Gittites. Uh, one of them, uh, you know... Um, probably the most famous of David's mighty men, uh, Uriah, who he ended his life, was not Israelite. And there were uh, an Ammonite uh, following. He was, a, he was a Hittite, I believe. Uh, there were Am- Ammonites uh, following uh, David. And you'll see in the book of Exodus, when they leave uh, Egypt, that there are a mixed multitude, which means there are other nations uh, a few from other nations that followed the Israelites and enjoyed the promises. And there was an expectation in Exodus 12 when they had the, um, he talked about um, the Passover, 
that in the Passover description that there was an expectation that when there were non-Jewish people that wanted to observe the Passover and follow the Lord, and Isaiah 56 talks about all that they, these faithful to God foreigners are going to, uh, to serve the Lord with you. This is what their life's going to look like. This is what you're going to do with them. Uh, they're, you're going to treat them well. Um, so if Paul knew the Old Testament, Paul would have to have concluded, knowing the Old Testament, just this one verse, but others, he would have to say that God is not the God of the Jews only. Hmm. So what do we do, and do with Romans 2? It's not just Jewish people who are believers. It's Gentiles. So God is not just the God of the Jews only, continuing in verse 29. Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? And of course, the obvious answer is yes, of the Gentiles also. Since God is one. This is Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6. God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the, I believe, the Shema that the uh, faithful Jewish people still uh, maybe quote this in a prayer. But God is one. This is why we're to have no other gods before us. Uh, the first of the Ten Commandments. And here, God is one. He is the only God. He is the God of all people, not just Jewish people. So what is, he, what is he clarifying in verse 29? Who God is. He is the God of all people. Now, if you're here today and you're not Jewish, like I'm not Jewish, isn't that a comfort? It is a huge comfort that God didn't create all of humanity and God chose one, um, one group of people, the Jewish people, Descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Only Jacob's uh, uh, offspring are called Israelites because Jacob is called Israel. And unless you're related to Israel, uh, Jacob, then you're not part of God's promised people and you are, you're outside. You're outside looking in. You have no chance of salvation. But Paul's going to say, wait a minute, isn't God not just the God of the Jews, he's the God of all people, of the Gentiles also. That's all non-Jewish people. And the answer is obviously yes, of the Gentiles also. So God is the God of all people. And then verse 30, or or since God is one, he's the only God, he will justify, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. I looked up by and through. They are different Greek words. I'm like, okay, that sounds like there are two different ways of salvation. No, it's not. It's the same way. Uh, One could be that the Jewish people chosen by God still have to be related to God by faith. There are people who thought they were, I'm Jewish, so I don't have to trust in a Messiah because I'm related to Abraham. We follow Moses, and John the Baptist and Jesus multiple times went after people that thought they were okay with God, didn't think they needed a Savior because they were Jewish. They could trace their lineage back to a certain tribe of Israel, which Paul could do. He was a Benjamite. Whoa! Over a thousand years after Benjamin lives, Paul knows which tribe he's from. Yeah, do you know any relatives that you have over a thousand years in your past? I bet you don't. (laughs) You say, oh yeah. Okay, you might, (laughs) but you might be wrong too. But Paul was able to, with the genealogy of the Old Testament, family lineage, figure out which tribe he was from. Whoa, he was Jewish? He knew which tribe he was from? But he's not related to God because he's Jewish. He's only related to God by faith. You see that there, the circumcised or the circumcision, that's the Jewish. God will justify the Jewish people by faith. And the uncircumcised, how do they come to God? Well, God didn't choose them like he chose Israel, but he does choose. 
We'll see that in uh, Romans 9 through 11. We call that election. And here, the uncircumcised are justified through faith as well. There is an article, the faith, there at the end of verse 30, and the NIV probably does the best for translating it, the same faith. We just have the word faith both times. But when you add the same faith, emphasizing Jewish people are saved, are justified by faith, and those who aren't Jewish are justified by the same faith, you're like, okay. Same God, same faith, same salvation. Simply faith alone. So what does this clarify in verse 30? How God justifies by faith and who God justifies, whoever is trusting. It is faith alone. You can't get around it. You're not better if you're Jewish. You're not less of a person if you're Gentile. Everyone is part of God's family and everyone in God's family has is there because of the work of God giving us his righteousness as we have trusted in him alone. And then verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law? Here's some logical questions like, okay, so why do we even need the law if it's all by faith, right? Do we overthrow the law? The word overthrow means to put away or put it out of the way. All right, we don't need this anymore. Let's just get rid of it, okay? Do we get rid of this law by this faith? And his answer, strongest Greek negative, by no means, absolutely not. On the contrary, okay, on the contrary? It sounds like, Paul, that you have been saying we are saved by faith, and everyone's saved by faith alone, and now apart from the law. So why do we even need the law, Paul? Why can't we just get rid of it? Put it out of the way. Just take the first 39 books of your Bible, rip them out. We don't need them. We just need the last 27. No, no, we need the law. Why? Well, we, we mentioned that a week or two ago. Romans 4 is going to mention the value of the law. Romans 5 is going to mention the value of the law. Romans 7 is going to mention the value of the law. And here it says, what does the law do? Or if it's faith alone. If it's faith alone, we uphold the law. Uphold is the opposite of overthrow. Uphold means to put in place or establish it. Don't get rid of it. Put it in a place, at a place that is part of the foundation of our faith. So he's going to build on that. He's just given us an overview here. He's just clarifying a few things, and we're not going to go into detail. We'll go into detail later as we get more of uh, Romans 4 and 5 and 7. Uh, But for now, he clarifies the relation of faith and law. And I told you I was going to give you the rest of Isaiah 56. You notice that the screen changed to verse 7. So the foreigners are um, included in God's family in Isaiah 56, 7 as they're faithful to the Lord, worshiping the Lord, remembering the Sabbath. Now verse 7 says, These I will bring, this is God talking, These I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. Here are foreigners bringing sacrifices to God in the Old Testament, and God says they are allowed to come. I will, I want them to come, and I will accept their sacrifices and their burnt offerings on my altar. I capitalized my to show you who was speaking, and it, it refers to God. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Old Testament word for Gentiles is that word peoples or nations. You'll see in your Bible often it is nations or peoples. And... Does this verse, the end of this verse, sound familiar in the Gospels? It should. Two times Jesus cleansed the temple. And the disciples, after he cleansed the temple, had this verse come to mind. Remember the phrase that the disciples remembered about Jesus cleansing the temple? My house shall be called a house of prayer. Do you know where in the temple Jesus cleansed? He cleansed the court of the Gentiles. 
See, the Gentiles were in the outer part of the temple. They weren't allowed to go in to where the widow gave her two mites. They weren't allowed to go in where the Jewish people were allowed to go inside the temple. They had a huge court. Like The, the inside the temple maybe been around this size, but the outside was huge, and that's where they had the, the money changers and selling, and that's where they allowed people to cut through. And the closest the Gentiles could get to God was that outer court, and their prayer and their worship was interrupted by animals people just using it to cut through, and the guards weren't doing their job and, and guarding and protecting the Gentiles' worship until Jesus came. And at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, the day of his um, triumphal entry, he cleansed the temple, and he cleansed the court of the Gentiles so that the Gentiles could worship the Father because of Isaiah 56, 6, and 7. And the disciples said, and Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And you have made it a den of thieves. See, Jesus wanted the Gentiles to worship the Father in spirit and the truth. He wanted the Samaritans to worship the Father in spirit and the truth. He wanted all the Jewish people to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And he took it upon himself twice to cleanse the temple so that the Gentiles could worship the Father and not be distracted. They could bring their burnt offerings and their sacrifices to be accepted by God and that they could go to the house of God and find that it was a house of prayer for them. And what did this show? Paul probably heard as a young man, maybe a teenager at the time of the temple cleansings, he probably heard about this crazy guy who cleansed the temple. But now it's starting to make sense that God is the God not just of Jewish people. He's the God of the Gentiles. And how do the Jewish people and the Gentiles have access to God? It's all by faith. Same God, same way of salvation. Not two different ways of salvation, same way of salvation. It is by faith alone. How the Old Testament people got saved, trusting in a coming Messiah. How we as New Testament believers get saved, we trust in a have-come Messiah. Same Messiah. One looked forward, we look back. Same God's plan, God's righteousness given to rotten sinners. It is by faith alone. So what do we do with this passage? Well, you could probably guess on the top there of the notes, okay, he's going to hammer us for our boasting. That's true. We're going to grow in humility. We are a proud people. Our salvation doesn't eliminate all of our pride. When we look back at the day that we got saved, we think, I don't know if you ever have done this. I looked in the mirror and thought, God did a good thing in saving me, or he got somebody really special. Like, maybe you don't think that way, but I've, I've thought that way about myself. And it's, it's gross, it's rotted, it is my flesh speaking and not the Spirit. We all need to grow in humility. And how does this passage help us to grow in humility? By thinking and concluding that the only reason we will be in heaven is because of Jesus. You and I will not be in heaven because of our works. You and I will not be in heaven because we sang, we gave money, we went on mission trips, we helped people. We will not be in heaven for any of those reasons. And you add to your own list, the only reason, not this reason plus your works, nope, the only reason we will be in heaven is because Jesus gave us his righteousness. And we can see in Romans 1 to 3, all of us are unrighteous. All of us are sinners. So we need to grow in this thinking. This needs to be a dominant thought in our minds as we think back at the day of our salvation and our humility should be growing and our pride should be shrinking. Why do we need to think this way? 
because it doesn't only affect us. If we are proud, we will look down our long noses of people and be like the, the religious, not right with people at the beginning of Romans 2 and not share Christ with them because they deserve, those rotten people deserve to go to hell. You don't deserve to go to hell too. I deserve to go to hell. We all deserve to go to hell. That humbles us. And the only way for anyone to be in heaven is Jesus. We tell the immoral person like the woman at the well, like the tax collectors, like the people that you would avoid. If you saw them on the sidewalk, you would cross the street, pass them, and then cross back behind them. You do not want your kids close to them. You don't want to befriend them. You want to avoid them. Let me encourage you, don't avoid people. Jesus had to go through Samaria to talk to that woman at the well. And the disciples tried to avoid her. They wanted to walk around Samaria. He said, no, we've got to go through Samaria. Her morality, having five husbands and the person she's living with wasn't her husband, caused her to be an outcast even in her own town. And yet Jesus made it a point that she was the first one that he talked to in that town. Because he knew this, the only way f for her to be in heaven was him. I mentioned Wednesday, it's probably recorded, that if people come in our church that look different than us, they may have used their body as a billboard for tattoos. They may have piercings in every place that you could possibly imagine putting a hole in your body. If God wants that person with him in heaven for all eternity, would he send them here? If he would have to send them somewhere else, then we need to grow in our humility. There are many other applications for this, but don't look down on people. We need to grow in our humility. And then we need to grow in our trust. If it is by faith alone that we come to Christ, if of course requires humility for us to trust in uh, someone that we haven't seen, in uh, something that we haven't seen him do, in that he is alive and that Christ is at God's right hand. We have to grow in our trust. So what does this passage teach about trust? We need to see and use God's established law. We need to trust in God's Word, the Old Testament as well as the New. Trust in the law of God. You say it's out, the world says it's outdated. I don't care what the world says. Paul, by faith alone, says, we establish, we uphold, we don't set it aside, we put it in its place, and it's a valuable place, a place that we all need. We need to bring God's law to bear on someone's life as it showed us that we were a Romans 1, 2, or 3, and maybe some all three sinner and needing a Savior. So see the law, use God. God's established law to show the need for saving faith. Grow to trust the Word of God and help other people to trust it. Let's pray. Our Father, we are proud people who avoid people that are different than us, that are hard cases, we would say. We would just rather you send someone else to them or that they would randomly find the gospel on, on the internet. 
I pray that you'd help us not to avoid uh, people. Help us to welcome people that you're drawing with open arms. Help us to be loving them and humble and uh, not think that we're better than them at all. I pray also that we would trust your word as we see that the law um, upholds, is upheld when we think um, correctly about faith alone. Help us to use the law um, and help us to value it and see uh, how helpful it is in sharing the gospel with those who are breaking your law. And some of them don't even know they're breaking your law. Help us also to reach out to people who think that you are not their God, but you've created them and you will judge them. And you've sent your son to save them. And they can be your God. You want to be their father. And I pray that you would help us to reach out to those who are far from you. Bring them to yourself. And if it is your will that you use us, help us to be usable uh, for your glory and bringing many people into your kingdom. We know that you get all the glory and we'll continue to remind ourselves of that in Jesus' name. Amen.